Alright guys, um, I'm going to talk about some of this stuff in a little different way. Some of you guys might find this a bit more interesting because I can actually pull up some of the uh, channels. Um, this is a prime example of the UK education system. This is MPC. MPC is a charity organisation that was set up by two Goldman Sachs guys to assess things on behalf of organizations, charities, blah, 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 education systems. And here's a prime example of the sort of garbage you get. This is what is a well-rounded education. I'm going to, should I tell you it or should, can you read it? Um, I'll go over it very quickly, it, you know, you can read it yourself. As a teaching union conference season returns, ushered in by chill, wind and snow, and we can, we can come to ourselves with a warm feeling of how students' well-being. With the exam season looming, teenagers' stress level will inevitably begin to rise. How are they able to cope? In the Ofsted framework, schools aren't explicitly measured on activities that support well-being as PSE is often squeezed, yet most teachers intuitively uh, know the students who are feeling low, don't learn as effectively as they might, and as less confident in a test exam situation. This is why many schools work with a range of organizations, often from the youth sector, to complement the support that they can offer themselves, but the question often asked is, how effective is this? We are particularly pleased to learn about a new commission, chaired by former Children's Minister Tim Loughton, Job for the Boys, which will look into the evidence of good practice for successful partnerships between schools and youth organization. It will investigate how work together can help to improve young people's social and personal development. Evidence that is not of, uh, evidence that has not often been collected in the past, or it has is largely anecdotal and lacks substantial data that proves a pattern or trend. Although we hope to see temperatures rise next month, you're going, Matt, what the hell are you talking about, aren't you? That's my point. These twats, um, I say that a little bit strong there, are advisors. And they haven't even described what the hell they're talking about. The title's very obvious. What is a well-rounded education? Here does not cover that fact. As you go in here, although we hope to see temperatures rise next month, we hope that all student anxieties does not, and in the season of debate around schooling, we would love to see discussion of students' well-being on the agenda. Well-being Trust suggests in the recommended code of governance for schools that the key performance indicators should include measured beyond test scores. Yada, yada, yada. That is not well-rounded. In fact, to me, that is why somebody was asking me, and I'll go over to our comments in a minute. But the reason I highlight this is a lot of schools have no idea what well-rounded actually means. It's why you're seeing stuff relating to LGBTQs being pushed as an agenda in uh, Birmingham schools, for example, because they do not recognize, that they would say that is well-rounded as part of the educational system. But that's not well-rounded. That's manipulated. As you can see here, they don't even know what they're talking about. And now, if we go over to where we are, and we'll go through our comments today, um, what we have, gyms I've already covered, so slightly different subject, but we'll, I want to focus on this bit about the um, schooling and stuff because I want to cover some important topics relating to that. Uh, as Chris Allen and Ray Forever brings out, I've got to say you explain everything regarding Philippines better than any other channel. You present info and options fairly accurate and with a sense of want to help us with our journeys. Yes, one of the things I do a, po a point, make a point of, and as I mentioned, I have no objectives here. It's not financial. I don't make enough money on this channel to be worth my time, in all honesty. Um, I just like doing it. Um, because when I went to the Philippines in 2007, I found data very obsolete. They were written by predominantly very old men trying to make money off e-books. As such, the information was either buy my book and it was full of garbage that they had actually had from 10 years earlier. Or the other option was going on to forums and dealing with predominantly people with either mental issues, alcohol issues, or womanizing, or simply got nothing better to do with their time. Um, a lot of the good people simply avoid all that stuff. And this is why when YouTube actually started to open up like this, it's something that a lot of these people couldn't focus on and haven't, because they're not visual. 
the, a lot of these people like to hide in the background. But anyway, we'll go down this because it, some of these points are important. Um, I'm going to go with Christmas trees first. There we go. Sorry, but your points on education make no sense whatsoever. You said that they do not teach reading and writing in Spain. It's not that they don't teach it. They do not teach it to a level where people can read or write. Um, what you have is a very basic system. Then they move the emphasis onto the parents. In Spain, I find we spend a lot of time teaching the kids. Like the mathematics, we spend a lot of time in the evenings and stuff doing mathematics. That's what I focus on. My wife does lingua, languages, um, and we do a lot of homework with the kids. My, our kids are, are very bright anyway, but the, the point is, we do get messages. I did some tutorials on the, the mathematics, because the mathematics systems, this grid system, um, it was written by somebody that couldn't do maths. Now, why you would have somebody that couldn't do maths creating the syllabus for everybody is beyond me. It's a bit like saying anybody could be a mathematician and if you don't understand, it doesn't matter. Just stack a load of sticks on the floor and if you can make it up and it works, that's fine. We'll get everybody to do that. It's stupid. It's idiotic. Um, my son at two and a half years old was better at mathematics than some kids at his age now um, because he actually does traditional mathematics. He understands mathematics. Um, but at the same time, a lot of kids have been sold this system, which is very, very visual. Now, why does it matter? Well, I'm not being funny. If you're at a bar, just saying you're at a bar, and somebody says, how much is my bill? Hang on, give me 10 minutes. Let me draw a grid. I'll move my 10s, I'll move my 1s and whatever. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You look at a roof over there, and like I'll tell you now, I can go, well, that roof... It's got a pitch on it. It's about two meters. Yeah, it's about two meters that way, four meters that way. The pitch on it's about 45 degrees. I can work out the number of tiles on it. That's not taught. But this is the sort of stuff that is worth learning. But when you're doing bundles and stuff, it's at a lower level than these kids actually understand because they're smarter than that. <laughs> Predominantly, these kids are smarter than that because the system was written by somebody who couldn't do maths and they've made it the system for the whole of this region. I assume somebody got a nice bung for the books that people have had to buy but anyway that's my personal opinion on that but the, ultimately it's a dumbing down. Now the reading and writing if you look at the literacy and other issues coming out of the United Kingdom for example a quarter of all adults can't even read a bus timetable. Something very simple it says a lot. Now, if you start getting into penmanship, that doesn't even cover penmanship because penmanship isn't even taught. Here in Spain they do, in the UK they don't. Penmanship is something that's passed by the wayside. Well-rounded people is what's being pushed. And the reason I brought up the well-rounded description there from an advisor um, for Charities, schooling, etc. Is firstly set up by two Goldman Sachs guys, so obviously they know what they're doing relating to education of people's children. Oh my goodness, a bit of a eureka moment here, a bit of a uh, epiphany. Maybe they turn around and did it because they make a fortune tax free. Maybe they run it as an NGO, non government organization, non profit, um, and just siphon the cash off in my personal opinion because there's a lot of this stuff because the last thing you get with this is a lot of them are not regulated so if they're not regulated they can't make mistakes because nobody's monitoring for the mistakes or they're self-regulating which is often what NGOs and others are but anyway we'll carry on with it so yeah that's my issue with the they're not taught to read and write in the way they should do where you're sitting there for hours reading and writing reading a book reading a book a week sitting there going through your handwriting learning joined up writing I, I did put something related to it, joined up writing because they're actually saying well in this computerized world we don't need to be able to read and write idiots of course you do everybody needs to read and write because the one of the fundamental things i do recognize is even with this planet we have with all this technology 
A EMP, for example, could be triggered, an EMP, electromagnetic pulse, could be triggered through, a, through an asteroid actually hitting the planet. It would make all this stuff completely worthless overnight. It would have to restart and rejig everything. But if everything is reliant on computerized technology, we have given away all our information <laughs> in a format that's going, well, we've got it in the hard drives, but we don't know how to start a hard drive up anymore. Um, I know that's an extreme version, but the same way, taking notes, going to meetings and stuff is still traditionally done in handwriting. If you look at Mark Zuckerberg, when he goes to a meeting, he actually puts blue tack over the camera and the microphone because he doesn't want people listening to the meetings. <laughs> I laugh at that because obviously we obviously know what he gets up to himself, but it's funny how he respects his own privacy. But there's a prime example of where you may actually want pen and paper. If you're going through something or designing something or doing a thesis, it's, I find it better in note form. As you'll see here, I'm not going to show you what's in here, but I don't know if you can see it. But I generally have notes on a regular basis. I write daily. So that is a prime example of something a lot of people are not doing anymore. And a lot of it is because of things like this. But these things have no reason to be in a school. When I was a kid, we didn't have a smartphone. We didn't, have a, we didn't even have a house phone. We didn't need one. But the whole point is, people are going, my kids need to be in touch with me 24-7. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. There's no need for them in the schools. There's no need for them to be tracking on Facebook and all, all this garbage media. It is counterproductive garbage. Um, what's more important is they actually go to school to get educated. Being a well-rounded person is pushed in one way, but the reality is the opposite. Like I was saying, the LGBTQ thing has been pushed as part of the education on relationships and whatever. But ultimately, I'll tell you my important stance here on that information especially with kids under 12 years old they shouldn't be engaging in any activity which defines that anyway um, a lot of people have no sexual interest at those ages anyway and I do think implanting a lot of this stuff is not healthy because at the end of the day I'm not saying there's something wrong with this or that. I'm just simply saying that they shouldn't even be engaged in this till at least 13 years old. The information side, not about the actual uh, acts. But the, the point is it should be a case of just recognizing kids are kids. And we seem to be moving the point where they're trying to say that somebody is transgender at birth and things like this. And you're just like... People don't even know what they are at birth because those thoughts haven't even got to the point of thoughts where they could actually understand them. They're still trying to learn what smell is, what sound is, and trying to take in the information around them. But this is being all distorted by the garbage media that exists around us. Um, now, the point being is, well, well-rounded to me should mean you know how to cook. You know how to look after yourself. You know how to basic first aid. But ultimately, those things will not get you a job. When I'm saying cooking, I'm on about eggs and chips. I'm not on about doing a souffle or uh, Michelin star restaurant stuff. Because at that age, you're not going to be there. For, for most people, they're not going to be capable of doing that stuff. And at the end of the day, job-wise, go and work in the fish and chip shop when you're 15 that's fine that's a completely different thing um, I do apologize going outside with a chainsaw at the minute um, but they have changed the way the system works because the focus should be on fundamentals which is your maths your languages your um, reading writing ability sciences etc they have emphasized that we're making people well-rounded but often the subjects are not well-rounded subjects in the sense they are not teaching somebody how to cook, they're not teaching somebody how to plumb, they're not teaching somebody the fundamental things that they need to go through life. At the same time, 
they're being sold to you that they are and that that's where there's a fundamental problem um as as christmas tree you can see here not sure what you mean join up a word create sentences i assume no it's actually joined up writing instead of writing individual letters here in spain they already do that here the uk they, they don't and i can't understand why you know at the end of the day a lot of this stuff has been ongoing if you compare my handwriting to my brother's handwriting you can see the difference because my education was military my brother's education was actually from Crystal Whitehead's high school in Worcester. Um, but there is no emphasis on penmanship. There's no emphasis on improving handwriting. Where there should be other clubs and stuff, if your handwriting is atrocious, to actually push people that a little bit further instead of going, it's your parents' problem, which is what's going on today. Now, if we go down here, who else had a question? Oh, yeah. Mystic, mystical Tyler, 2009. The whole goal of feminism is the destabilization, uh, dis destabilization of the family unit. I would say it's, I couldn't say it's the destabilization of the family unit. I would actually say from the stuff I've seen, firstly, they have destabilized the family unit, whether they like it or not. But the second thing is they don't care. That's the, so whether that was intentional in the first place in the fact of destabilizing the lives in the family unit, I'm not 100 percent, but the re general response is, well, it doesn't really matter because we, we want to do what we want. Um, so I do think there, there is some serious issues there. The way more people become dependent on big brother government at the highest levels of power, these foes knows exactly what they're doing. The feminists do to a point. They do not recognize responsibility, but I'll get on to that and I'll cover that through another topic in a second. Uh, Matt, if you're looking deeper into education, many other things, you'll see that uh, find that there is most definitely a global agenda to standardize everyone's thinking and ways of doing things. It's a small elite that wants the schools to be dumbed down. It's a proper way to keep people down. And if you think you look deeper, you'll find that the true agenda behind feminism is to destabilize the family unit. It's all about keeping people dumb and divide against each other and centralizing power at the top. I will tell you about feminism and socialism because they go hand in hand in the way that feminism gets boosted through socialism. Working within the NHS and working within the um, things like the uh, housing communities, um, for example, the community housing, social housing, um, and, and these arenas that are predominantly unionized, and I apologize for this guy outside, he's been annoying me for the last two weeks. He's been building a swimming pool, but he's took half the road up. He just froze the steel, matting everything down. I, I'd have to guess any got a permit for the pool, but anyway. But uh, welcome to Spain. But anyway, the point being is, so I'm in the, this environment, and you find there are certain people in this environment that are 100% socialism. Um, but they're feminist socialists in many cases because they're women anyway. But the, what you find is they're supported from the unionist side regardless of being right or wrong. I'll give you some male versions so you can see the, the issues that you sort of face regardless of what side it is. There was a painter that was on one of my contracts before that was employed by a council. They don't paint anymore. But they have to employ these people and they keep them on. It's rather make them redundant and just get rid of them. They just keep them on for the next 20 years. Um, now, because he's a painter and they don't paint, they put him on duties on the broom. He would broom for two days and then go off sick for two weeks. They got unions involved and as they said, he's employed as a painter. He has asthma issues and stuff. We shouldn't be making him clean. Yet there is no other job he's capable of doing. Um, and at the same time, you can't get rid of this guy. The only way we did get rid of him was the fact that when he was off, he was actually at a car auction. The, he was actually in one of the council's vans that was caught um, about 150 miles away from where he should have been. He got a traffic ticket that was caught on CCTV. He was supposed to be off sick, and that's how he got, we got rid of him that way. But even then, he still had to go through the motions, and I would hazard a guess he even got a payout of some description for being sacked, for lying, stealing, and whatever. 
because he shouldn't have been using the vehicle for a start. But anyway, and obviously he's off sick on full sick pay. The point being, there's one from a guy's point of view. The, from the women's point of view, and I've dealt with a few of these people, and that they're stereotypical. And I'll be honest with you, I don't mind being stereotyped. I, I'm originally from Glasgow, family-wise, blood, blood, bloodline-wise, etc. So we're supposed to all be uh, drunks, violent, and methadone orientated, because that's that's the stigma attached with that. And I can take a stereotype; it doesn't affect me whatsoever. I couldn't care less, because that's it. But there was a woman, for example, that works with my father. Sorry, it doesn't. They go at the same camera club. She is from the NHS. And the NHS have the same problem of these people that are wrapped in cotton wool, which are often abusive and whatever, but they're, all, they're the first ones to go off sick with stress and whatever to suit themselves. And she was on about the one day, because uh, after the camera club, because uh, the, the, you have a chat with everybody, um, there'll be a seminar on photo software or types of things, whatever. She sat there and she just said, oh, four women were in a car and they went out for the day and they got, the, got to the journey on time and they all arrived unstressed on time and weren't lost. <laughs> I didn't even understand what she was talking about. You know, at the end of the day, even my dad mentioned it to me and I'm like, what is her problem? Because her problem is she has an issue that women have a habit of getting lost or whatever, which is stigmatized as a stereotype or whatever. But rather than just saying whatever, it becomes a issue. And this is where the socialism thing is tied with um, the feminism. Because the same week, me and my father were, were driving up to Tesco's to refuel his, his camper van. And there was three women sat in a car at the, at the curbside with a flat tire. And I see them. I said to my dad, they're waiting for a guy to come along. And my dad said, I'll oh, take a picture of it. We'll send, we'll send it to this woman. And I, and I took a picture. And on the, on the way back, lo and behold, car behind them, four-way flashes on. Three women stood on the curb on the mobile phones, guy changing the tire. I took another photo. Did I send them to her? The answer is no. Because the thing is, her joke wasn't funny. But now, I could have said that, and it was funny. Because it had just proven what people were actually talking about and how the stereotype comes out in the first place. But she would not have found that funny at all. She would have been offended. In the same way, when, she, when they were asking uh, what they should take on their trip, because they're going away for a photo trip for a couple of days, uh, she asked one of the guys there what she should take. Now, the guy being sarcastic, because he's just a sarcastic guy anyway, he does it to everybody, just say, oh, you're borrowing knickers. Because the whole point being is, sort your own bloody stuff out. I, how do I know what you need? Because what, what she was asking is, is it going to rain or whatever? And the answer is the guy's gone, I don't know. So his response was, you bro, and Nick is just, and just laughed. And, it's just, and she actually filed a complaint at the camera club, and he was reprimanded for it. That is what the problem is. Because she has an issue with it, and while I just say it to him, like, don't be such a twat or whatever, she created, creates an official complaint. Her crap joke if I had said, you know, I was there at the time and said, that's not funny, I don't understand what you're talking about, she would have raised a complaint that I was anti this or that because there's something psychologically wrong with some of these people. They have a chip on their shoulder over nothing. But on top of this, in the social housing, you, you often come across these very typical types of women in the sense that they... Not all women in social housing are the same. I want to stress that. There's a lot of fantastic people over there. But there are certain ones that are very stereotypical. They look like they make their own clothes. They've got that um, woven cardigan normally. And then some jumpers you wouldn't know where to buy one from. Along with that Theresa May greyness and the, the eyes that look like they haven't slept for, for four months and often stressed out and argumentative. They're vegans and very strongly feminist. 
And I come across them, probably every single housing association I come across. Not, there's only about one or two of them in each one. But the point being is, they bully people to get what they want. And the thing is, when you actually push back, they, they have no problem being very aggressive and in your face about stuff. And the way I deal with it, it says, look, not being funny, but your breath really stinks. At which point they're sort of annoying, but don't know, you know, the situation because you actually told them because they're, they're in your face like this. And I don't get intimidated by them. I just see them as a bit of a joke because quite simply they get what they want by being that way and myself. I do what I do my job and quite simply they can whistle. It ain't going to happen. You know, a lot of the time the guys, and it is predominantly guys that do the surveying, have gone off with stress. They've also gone off with um, issues relating to being accused of things. For example, a woman in one house has been after a kitchen for, for two years, doesn't get it. The woman next door to her gets a kitchen. Now, the woman next door has had her house flood damaged. So as such, she's entitled to a kitchen because the other one, being chipboard, is destroyed. But she doesn't understand or see that. What she does is she files a complaint that she, from her bedroom window, this woman got a kitchen because she knows she's seen the, the, the guy, uh, the surveyor, out in the garden with this woman uh, at 10 o'clock at night on a Friday evening, blah, 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 having sexual liaisons or whatever. Completely fabricated. The guy is suspended. In the same way that the feminist aggressive women bully a lot of these surveyor guys until they cave in. At the same time, this is why the budget's overrun. I don't cave in. Um, but the point being is, the, it's socialist feminism. Now, is it a case that there's an agenda here that is actually creating this, or the fact that they know they can get away with stuff and that's what's actually the pattern. It's not actually a case of it's something hidden going on, but more a case of because they know how to push the buttons and get away with it because the councils, local authorities, or wherever are worried about legal action, um, that is probably more of a driver. The, the law relating to, what's it, 1975 and women's women having the right to pick and choose their hours because they're more likely to have children is a prime example because feminists would use that along with union and unions to say that other people they, that they're entitled to this stuff because one of the things I did recognize with unions with having to deal with a lot of the stuff they get up to is they don't care about the business they couldn't care less it's not about whether it makes sense or not it's about how this positively impacts their members and this is the whole point because it goes round in a cycle because it's not all at this level. It goes all the way to the top because a lot of these people start off at the bottom and end up at the top. As such, a lot of the, a lot of the housing authorities I've been to, the top jobs, they're off with stress as well. They are not functioning like normal enterprises and they're a fester pit of these sort of things. Teachers are another one that do it. The police do it. They're, they're everywhere um, because they have a heavily unionized environment that will protect feminist views regardless if they're right or wrong. The ruling relating to the women wanting women police PCs, um, police constables, getting the same allowances as the men that are doing the evenings and weekends because obviously they don't have to because they're the family friendly hours is actually hiding behind the fact that it's not family friendly hours it's actually this 1975 law that is prior to all this movement of um, equality false equality um, they win their cases the same with the equal pay stuff they win the cases and none of it's equal it's completely biased, it's completely manipulated, but at no point will anybody challenge it because nobody wants to be seen as a anti-feminist, anti-woman, um, victimizing women. In the same way they play on it the other way as well. The NHS, no money, who do they roll out? Nurses. 
Same with the fire brigade. They roll out the men on that side. We need our firemen. Most firemen don't actually fight fires anymore because they have a let it burn policy and have done for a long time. And some places don't even have enough water anymore. And this is why when people ask me about this stuff, I know a lot more information because you have to remember, I, I work in the infrastructure. I work in the, the environment that they're supposed to be protecting. Because I, I analyzed the pipework, I analyzed the sewers, the water table, everything. Because the information is relevant to my clients. The same with a lot of um, industrial areas in the United Kingdom. They're built on waste land where the sewages, sewage areas are often um, Victorian. Now, they're already at capacity before they added these industrial estates. And it's why you find that people are going, I've got a water leak on the roof on a large warehouse. And you go there and says you haven't got a leak in your roof. Is the pipe is full all the way from underground and actually gone all the way to your roof. There is nowhere for that capacity of water to go in the heavy rainfall because nobody actually monitors the amount of concrete, the amount of tarmac and other things that has been covering the United Kingdom for the last few decades because it alters where water goes. But that's what I specialize in, all this sort of useless information because it's useless in the sense most people don't use it. It's relevant in the sense that it's why we end up with flooding and stuff, but hey ho, that's another story for another day. But yes, um, are they dumbing people down? Definitely, because there's nobody questioning it. If you go to local housing authorities, local councils, um, schools, etc., you will find they have policies such as no blame policies. So even when somebody is blatantly in the NHS, for example, killing people, um, they will actually make them go with a golden handshake and then they'll prop up somewhere else as a consultant on what they were failing at before. Uh, MSRA is a prime example. If you look at the, the main consultant on that, they were actually involved in killing people because of her failings. But at the same time, she is championed as somebody who knows about MSRA because she's had experience in killing people. But hey ho, that's for another day. But that is why there is no question on this. There is no evaluation. You look at the way the schooling and education systems operate. I can't really speak for the US side, but Ofsted and what have you in the United Kingdom, there is too many people from within the same education system and not other environments that are more likely to have some common sense injected. For example, business leaders. They know where they have gaps in the market and can see fundamental flaws even down to people that use um, machine presses and stuff and can read or write. I've had people turn up to job interviews before and I've just asked them to fill in their name, address and that sort of stuff as a very, very basic um, bit of information because they've already got a job anyway, you only have to turn up. Couldn't do it. I've had people just walk out. You know, you leave them the paperwork, come back, and they're not there anymore. Yet, what you'll have is the school figures will actually say, we're improving our figures. We have more people pass the exams. But the exams are easier every year. They're not smarter. The education system, where they're shifting to a complete enterprise now, where before you would actually study something, and it'd be quite difficult. When I did my electronics, it was riddled with mathematics relating to uh, physics. But at the same time, you will get people now doing social media studies. You'll get them doing sports stuff. Um, because one of, one of the things that uh, Worcester University, you have a look at their syllabus, for example, they're getting pumped full of cash for people that are um, primary school car carers and teachers and stuff, um, sports teachers and things. And you're thinking, where do all these people actually go? Because there's no way there's enough jobs for these people out there. Yet their, their focus on the university is on subjects which have a limited, limited job resource. They're not teaching mathematics. They're not teaching engineering. They're not teaching nuclear fusion or um, molecular structures or something that would actually... Uh, is in demand because there's a lack of people actually understand a lot of this stuff. 
They are teaching easy subjects. The whole dumbing down is everywhere. And that's my point. And it all, it's all part and parcel of this environment that does not allow responsibility to turn around and sack somebody for incompetence. Sacking somebody for killing somebody. Sacking somebody for failures. Look at Glenfield Fire. That is fudge like no tomorrow. They went after the contractor initially, but then the contractor already disclosed the fact that they already knew it was wrong because they were, they were actually given the right uh, quotations and everything else. They rejected it and went for a cheaper option. That sort of stuff is very, very common because I know because I analyze this stuff. I go into environments where they haven't been doing proper testing and maintenance for decades. I go into environments where they are lucky they haven't killed not just one person, but maybe 50 people. Legionella breakout, things like that, because they haven't, not only have they not been testing it, they haven't even been aware that they had to. No responsibility, because nobody's actually focused on, on making people responsible. That's where I come in. Because I go there and I analyze all this, I analyze all the risks, I see this, this and this. I put together a whole package of information, a central archive of all the information and what they need to look at, etc. But a lot of the time, even then, they just put it on the shelf. But as I always tell them when, I, you know, when a lot of these things finish, I says, I'm telling you now, you're breaching your fire code, you're breaching this, you're breaching that, etc., etc. The reason I'm telling you now is because I have told you I'm going to reinforce it with a follow-up email to confirm that I have made you aware of it because my responsibility has now passed from me to you because I have advised you and told you exactly what you need to do. If at some point I ended up with a Glenfell fire scenario, hope, hope it never happens, I keep my emails forever. I can refer back to stuff uh, probably 91, the earliest stuff. But the point being is, you've got to do that stuff. Because these other people, the first thing they'll do is blame you. Thanks for watching.